Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those who are in Asia, anyone attending from outside Asia, good morning or, or good evening or good night or whatever your time zone is. Um, today, we come to the last uh, episode of this webinar series. This is the second series. So with, with this, we've done uh, eight episodes already. Um, this webinar series, um, normally hosted by me uh, i'm the business development for graphics of singapore and james is the bim consultant for graphics of singapore um, in this uh, series we will we already went through um, three episodes so the first one i went through library objects by importing uh, libraries from external uh, places and bring it to Archicad and reach the specifications uh, with properties. Then James, uh, the following week, talked about some tips and tricks on using curtain wall. Um, that was very helpful because he showed us how we can use uh, the curtain wall tool for different uh, purposes. Um, then last week I showed how to get started with Rhino Grasshopper Archicad connections. So what is the concept, what do we need to install, uh, what do we need to, what are the places where we can find uh, know-how to learn how to master this kind of, of um, design strategy. Uh, today we'll talk about, um, you know, the topic is, is probably a bit too detailed. So beam non-stop by empowering a remote team uh, collaborating in real time in a model. So basically, we have uh, uh, Zenru, uh, Sam, and Desi from Goy Architects, and they will show how a uh, very nimble team uh, with loads of talent can work together, connected, even being in, in different uh, locations worldwide. So how the technology empowers them to, to bring together their, their work. So, this is Desi, Sam, and, and Zenru. Um, you might want to drop by their website. The, the website is just Google Goy Architects. Um, and you can see they're a award winning um, company. They have got a few awards recently. Um, and we even have a case study in our website. So, in case you want to drop by graphisoft.com you'll be able to see there uh, a case study in detail about one of their projects. So uh, without taking more time, because we're all here to see uh, how they do all these amazing designs and how they get connected and work together, I'll pass the mic to, to Zenro and uh, let's see what she has to, to show to us. So, Zenru, can you try to share your screen now? Yeah. Okay, perfect. This is quite smooth. Look like the TV. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm very happy that everyone is here today. Uh, we are uh, very honored to have uh, Graphisoft actually invite us for this webinar. Uh, maybe just a very quick uh, introduction to everybody because uh, we are relatively a new team we started our firm in 2000 late 2015 so um, if you guys are not aware of it already uh, currently i'm in station in singapore jesse is stationed currently in jakarta uh, and sam is currently in uh, chiang mai so how we work is that we work collectively in Southeast Asia uh, through the BIM software, through the BIM cloud, and we work on a daily basis uh, with Archicad. So this is how we roll. So I think the, the concept that we wanted to share with everybody is that um, I think that a lot of people think that BIM is actually a very uh, scary kind of a, a, a structure as well as a makeup. But for us, when we look at beaming, we think about dreaming because we always have this dream that each of us can be kind of not tied to where we are in terms of locations. And we could be wherever we want to work, wherever we want and do projects wherever we can find projects to be. So in this case, we are actually looking at 
Singapore, Chiang Mai, and Jakarta slash Bali. So whenever we do have projects in Southeast Asia region, we could actually get uh, our team that is stationed in that country to actually start working on the project. So we are kind of uh, trying to go in Southeast Asia region as a team. So the daily basis, how we work is that we are all connected via Beam Cloud and, um, and three of us will be logged in. We have a small little server, which we'll explain to you later in detail. And um, every day we'll just check in and then we'll start to do our uh, modeling together. So we start design process directly from Archicad itself, um, all the way to construction and uh, to the build form. The range of the projects, I think uh, if some of you guys are not very familiar, uh, we do from residential uh, to industrial. And we also have a project in uh, Indonesia, Sukabumi, which is a farm stay. And um, basically, Archicad enables us to do a wide variety of uh, scale, irregardless even to an object, to a big seven-story industrial building, which we'll show the case study to you guys. So some of our projects are like Sukha Sangtai Farm Stay, uh, the Hing House, which is in Singapore, we converted a terrace house into using reclaimed windows. Uh, Shitsuko Koro that went uh, slightly viral on Mothership a few weeks ago, uh, whereby 40,000 people actually liked this uh, apartment, which is actually a HDB BTO that we redo the interiors. Gahana, which we try to use a different kind of curvature to play with the light. And the biggest one that we did in Singapore is actually a seven-story industrial building that is at MacPherson area. So the team today, we will be talking on three points. The takeaway of the three points will be hardware, software, and humanware. So hardware, we have divided into the type of hardware that we use. How do we set up? The second part is actually the software. What are the different types of uh, programs that we use other than uh, Archicad to kind of uh, do a platform for us for collaborating usage? And humanware is basically the values, uh, also in terms of our practices, how we actually go about doing it. So we'll share some of those like mantra or spirit with you guys to kind of understand how we are able to work uh, regionally, uh, remotely. So maybe to Desi. Yeah. Uh, I will share about the hardware that we use. Next slide. Okay, basically we set our server in Singapore and then from Chiang Mai or from Bali or from Jakarta, we can access it to work. This is a glimpse of our server in Singapore. So we set up Very a really relatively... Entry. Yeah, <laughs> but it's, it works. So we set a relative uh, cheap server hardware and then thank to the uh, Singapore in internet connection that is very fast and reliable we can then upload it to the internet and then all the team member can access it but we also have a nas for backups and we use the offsite backup uh, amazon aws so our workstation <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so the, the window of our workspace is like this. Uh, in Singapore, my workstation, uh, Ipli Architects is kind enough to give me a working desk. So I'm sharing an office with them. So I just work from a desk and with a laptop. And at home, my setup is with a desktop with a laptop so that I have a bigger screen to look at for the modeling. Yeah, this is my workstation. Uh, but the robot is not part of the, of the hardware. Yeah? It's just a decoration. <laughs> So it works for you, the robot, when you're not there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so here is my working place. So actually in Chiang Mai, we have a few people here. So I just try to get the office that a little bit like crowded and surround with a lot of trees and swimming pool just for our <laughs> enjoying. It's <laughs> a swimming pool, you know. <laughs> not, not bad. Eh? Okay. <laughs> not bad at all, right? It's like... <laughs> So some tips, maybe Desi, you want to explain? Yeah, because uh, some of us is in Southeast Asian countries and uh, no, sorry, I mean, outside <laughs> Singapore. <laughs> Internet in Singapore is really reliable. The electricity is really reliable. But here, sometimes we have this power sh shortage or blackout. Sometimes the Internet connection is not stable. So for the power shortage, usually we always, always use UPS. 
so sometimes when it's off we can still save the file first so our work is not lost and for the unstable internet connection our tips for us from us is always uh, prepare spare internet source like 4g or anything that um so because our works really rely on the internet. We put everything on cloud storage, so we really, really need this uh, internet to work. That's why we always have the backups. And other thing is because uh, we cannot meet every day. I mean, meet directly every day, so we only meet via online meeting, Zoom, or other thing. Then we also need webcam and headset with noise cancellation. It's quite important. So software part. Maybe so our, yeah, for for the software part, right? Because we are like all in the different countries, so that's why we we need to try or try to find the software that can support our work. So first thing, we need the cloud storage, which is, we use a Dropbox right now to store our file, and we can access from everywhere. And second thing that we need is for our discussion, which is we always discuss every day so basically we use zoom whatsapp beam x and miro and later i will show you later what is this kind of a uh, program and the next one is very important that we use archicad to replace the traditional way that we always like do the 2d and then 3d and after that it's like have the a lot of miscommunication between and this discrepancy so i think the archicad help us a lot on our teamwork so for the Dropbox, right, the good thing of the Dropbox is right, we can access the file from any device and everywhere because we we are like moving a lot and we are go to site and we can access our file and can access our Beam X and all of that. So I think Dropbox is good. Okay, next one is uh, Miro. This one we just found uh, the Miro. The Miro is like a online a whiteboard that we can discuss in the real time. So everyone can like just throw the image, sketch, put a sticky note, and we can use the video call here also to really talk and really it's a real time to do things. So it's very, very useful for us. So we use Miro a lot to really talk and working. So this one is like can replace our like meeting room in the office, like, like you need to throw the papers and draw something like that, right? So we use this one to replace it online. Yeah, you can see yeah, and the good thing. Mm. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, the good thing for it is it can keep here. So because usually we we do the meeting and then after discussion we like keep somewhere and throw somewhere. Right? I think this one is really good that we always have the record what we already talking about and what is the issue that haven't solved or not solved yet. Something like that. Yeah, can do. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Next one is the Archicad. Yeah. I think they yeah. can, yeah. Yeah, we will show how we use Archicad in our different stage of uh, the project, like for design to documentation to the construction by showcasing some of our projects. Yeah, the first one here is Suka Santai. It's a farm stay in Indonesia. It's very interesting project in Sukabumi. in yeah so what we want to show here is that we share the beam x uh so we make the model we make the project in archicad right then we share the beam x with the clients because we cannot be there all the time so the clients or the uh, contractors can really see the beam x and if they have any problems they can just sketch on it and send us to via WhatsApp directly and get the response from us directly. So it's really uh, real time, the work that we did on the, uh, on the construction site and also in the office. Yeah, like, yeah, show you how some. And this one is the Glinden Burn. Uh, it's ongoing project at the moment. Here we we create the model in Archicad, so it's an interior project, and we want to study the lighting for this project. In this project, we uh, we can send, because we already have the pro, uh, the 3D in Archicad, so we can just 
export directly. I mean, like ask the lighting consultant, then they can uh, export directly the, the 3D model to the Lux program, and they can right away test out the lighting. So we can know how, how what's the intensity, like uh, the, the yeah. amount or how many lighting that we need. It's very really helpful. This one is uh, the hang house. I think Chandru mentioned it previously. It's um, in this project, we use a lot of reclaim timber, reclaim uh, windows or doors. Can, yeah, like in this, uh, in this slides, you can see how we arrange that reclaim windows on Archicad. So we create uh, these windows as an object and then we put it uh, on Archicad. Then we can uh, create the arrangement, do the tabulation, check the quantities. This reclaim windows, we get it from Yogyakarta. So at that time, we fly to Jogja to source for these uh, windows. Quite fun. <laughs> yeah, this is a tabulation. So it's really helpful because we can uh, like put ID on it, like RC1, RC2, RC3. Then uh, we can just like, like put it on 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 Archicad and then you can calculate the quantity. And this is the drawings that the contractor use on site to arrange the windows. Of course, some adjustment needed. Yeah, and this is the results. Quite pretty. Yeah. I think the very important part about the quantity is that because we are buying exact quantities. So the Archicad um, function that allows us to really calculate the exact materials that is required was very important. So in this case, because it was more like a collaboration with the builders as well, some of the building materials was actually imported uh, for, the, for the contractors based on our quantities. So it, we have to be very accurate and not to be like buying excessively and buying things to, for wastage. So I think this is something that is quite interesting as well that we could actually uh, just design exact quantities so that we don't waste resources. Then uh, Sam, maybe you want to talk about Chito Kokoro? Okay. <laughs> yes. okay. Okay, yes. Okay, this is uh, Chito Kokoro. We use this one, uh, we will show you how we documentation this one and what is like go through the detail of, of it. So this one, like we are doing the the tender drawing right, from from the main one, like the renovation work and also go in into the to draw the furniture as well. So actually the architect is not really help just like all the big part, but all the small part, like a small object we also create from it. Okay, so you can see this 3D. Right? Actually, we really built everything like exactly what is happened on the on the on the real thing. So even like the sofa and the furniture, everything is really like we built by Archicad and then we we really make follow it, and everything is like measure measuring like very exactly. And you see like the detail that we can add in and draw and then really produce the furniture yeah so the drawings from Archicad we really directly send it to the manufacturers in uh, Jogjagata or, or wherever we want to build the furniture and they follow our drawings on top of their shop drawings then uh, we have to be very precise so the good thing is that when it comes on site everything really fits <laughs> so that's really kind of scary every time when your construction site and your what you buy uh, offsite has to come out merged together. So I think Archicad lets us do that to have it really fit nicely into a project. So this is actually so a HDD project. You use yeah. 3D documents also, right? Uh, yes. Not just plans, sections, and elevations. Do you think that that helps yeah. like the, the visualization? Yes. Right? Actually, the way that we do it for our tender is that it should be foolproof. That means anybody who sees it has to understand, like, really, okay. like, they have to understand. So we would do it in such a way where, like, it is traits. So we divide our plans, like, uh, floor finishes, wall finishes, like, really traits so that if they really need to send out the drawings, which is what the contractors do, 
the package will already be self-explanatory so that there wouldn't be like any complications. Like they need to refer to the whole stack of drawings. So it's not like that. We do it really precisely as a trade. And we always supplement with a lot of 3D perspective so that they understand what is our intent. And if the site is not as per what, uh, they will then highlight to us, say, hey, you know, this doesn't look like your 3D. Do you want to, is there anything that you might want or might not want? So we eliminate any guessing work because we don't want that on site. Uh, yeah, hence like that. Okay. So I think the, the, the bigger project that we did in Singapore was uh, one taxing, which is a seven story industrial building. So this is really a jump of scale. Previously, we are talking about small scale furniture and now we are looking at facades as well as the whole building. So we did this project in Singapore with the full submissions uh, requirements. That means to FSSD, LTA, URA, all in one model. So my design model and my authorities model is all the same so that I don't do repetitive work. Any updates in the design is then updated on my authority submission as well. So the, the design of this uh, building, the concept is very, relatively simple. It is just to um, uh, have a rounded edge to this angular site. And then we wanted to have sun shadings that actually prevent sun from going into this corner, which is uh, a little bit more intense at the one of, one of the, the buildings. So we tried out many variation and taking nature because green is actually the corporate color of the, of the company. Taking nature as our inspiration, we tried several uh, variations in terms of green color. And uh, through this uh, exercise, we are also um, able to easily put it up on Archicad to be able to see the variations. So in this module, this is actually what we did for our construction uh, module for them of ease of um, installation on site, because we don't want to be there to tell them not to mix up the colors. So we come up with like a module system whereby each of them is kind of packed with a code and then they follow the system, which is then drawn on Archicad, which I think is actually quite interesting. This was actually done by Sam. So we created like a, a system whereby the color code uh, together with the module so that they wouldn't be uh, mistaken on site or like, we, even if they put up the wrong color, maybe we won't know, but yeah, <laughs> but actually they follow exactly as per this drawing. Yeah. So these are some of the final image, which uh, I think it's quite uh, interesting to be able to kind of uh, see it on 3D and then on, on the actual site itself, it looks like what we have built on Archicad. Very good. Yeah. So Grahana is also another small interior project. Maybe uh, Gassi wants to talk about it. Mm, yeah, in this project, we try to experiment with the curvature. Like the previous one is more uh, straight lines here. The client's wants a bit uh, sexy lines. <laughs> so with a lot of cur curves here and there. <laughs> and we also experiment with uh, the light things. And um, yeah, we, we, we did everything in Archicad. So actually, uh, to do this in Archicad is very simple, very easy. And uh, the Beam X is also very helpful for the contractors to, to build it on site. Um, yeah, like some changes, they can just type. Uh, highlight to us and we can see it directly. Yeah. So that's the final look of it. Wow. Okay. So uh, for the one soon, uh, basically we are doing the interiors for three five-story private house. So the architect is actually DP Architects. So when it comes to a bigger scale, so the concept that we use in our smaller scale project is exactly the same as large scale project. So it doesn't change. So in terms of how we uh, do the interior, in terms of like our light fixtures and stuff like that, it's exactly the same process. But when it comes to big projects, the complication comes in is when there is a lot, a lot of quantity. When the quantity expands, this is when the complications come in. But what we do uh, in the big models is that uh, we also use Archicad for small things like uh, ACMV, and we use uh, precise um, for electrical sockets. So the reason why we do that is that uh, all our drawings in terms of our lighting as well as our sockets, it is actually um, parametric and also in terms of it is a GDL object. So which allows us to tabulate the quantity of all of the lights as well as the switches. And when we do that, we, we are able to control the, the, the budgetary. That means like basically we are able to give the electricians like exact 
quantity so that they can do the exact precise uh, um, uh, cost analysis so that we can really control the design and we are in control of the design in that sense that because we know that this is the budget so we can manipulate the numbers instead of having it like up in the air and then we have to cut the design and then see whether the costing works or not. So even for the blinds, we are also doing the same thing because blinds for five for three houses, five stories can come up to a very large amount. So it's very important for us to kind of control the quantities. And through that, we can do that. I think the last project that we want to share is like a, a different project altogether. It is actually a conservation project that we recently got uh, together with uh, Xing Design and conservation uh, specialist is MAC consultants. So uh, it's a very nice uh, conservation project at 10 Pender Road. Uh, it is actually an old property of Tambunye. It's built in the 1910. So this is actually like the old conserved plants that, uh, that, that was in the archives of uh, National Archives of Singapore. So what we did was that we got a 3D scanner to actually scan this model, which did the survey of um, the 10 Pender Road. And using this survey uh, drawings, we were able to uh, come up with the 3D model of the conservation project, which is kind of, um, I think not everybody does the 3D beam modeling for the conservation project, but because we wanted to try, and also during this circuit breaker or this COVID situation whereby not everybody can be on site, we find that having a model is really facilitate our real-time discussion. And um, for us, it's also to see whether or not we could come up with like uh, possible modeling uh, tools could architect do such uh, ornate building uh, that is built in the 1910. So how we did is that after we have this 3D model, uh, it's very, very good for discussion because I could just call Shing Design, Stephen, and then we could talk over Zoom and we could drop in like um, perspective and we start to discuss like gutter details or like what is what is it that uh, you what what do you mean what do you mean by this area because with the 3d model it becomes all very very clear like immediately like we can say oh it's this portion or it's that portion then uh, then then it becomes very self explanatory and we can talk to the contractors also immediately with the 3d perspective we can have sketch and i just um, snapshot, screenshot, and I send it through WhatsApp, and then they will be able, okay, let's try out, see whether this is possible. I send it to the engineers, and they could say, okay, let's test out the uh, rainwater fall collection over at this portion. Then it gives us very speedy kind of uh, reaction time as well as design discussion, rather than this grid line GL12 to the AB and all that, I think it's like nobody even wants to open the PDF uh, file mm -hmm. to kind of like refer because it's just so not intuitive. But with the 3D model, we are able to do that. So I think it comes down to also the human wear. I think Desi and Sam, you can jump in anytime, yeah? So I think what we have shared so far is uh, software and hardware. But I think the more critical part that um, teams, uh, we, we would like to share with the team is actually the human wear which is maybe more values driven uh, and also like uh, expectations driven uh, kind of uh, mentality when you are going into remote meeting. So uh, just to share with you, our daily workflow is that we have a briefing in the morning. So every morning we will have, uh, every morning or every odd mornings we will have a call and we will check in, everybody will check in what they are doing, what they'll be doing for the next few days or like what is needed for the meetings for that day. Then we'll work and we'll casually chat over WhatsApp or whatever. So, so that will be our process. And end of the day, which we'll stop um, at our end work time, we will wrap it up and have a progress update. And we'll send a receipt and we'll release all as a good habit for being cloud kind of a workflow. I think our value system or our five tips uh, that we would like to share with everybody, uh, this is a little bit more like soft values already. Um, it's really this big concept about trust and respect. So we, because of this digital kind of uh, communication as well as workflow, our time could be very in flux, right? You don't know when it's morning, when it's night, when are you working, when you're not working and stuff like that. So we keep it a point that we have a very fixed and strict working time. So in my case, it's 10 to 7. For them, it's 9 to 6 because there's one hour difference. And we will make sure that we are available within this time and we have a shared calendar so that everybody knows what is going on. So if I have a meeting on site, they know where I'm going, when, um, when they can kind of like WhatsApp and disturb and when everybody should be doing their stuff. 
And we really encourage uh, family time and leisure time because we think that this is the time whereby we could rejuvenate ourselves and also be more inspired to do nicer stuff. And the trust is that we trust that everybody is doing their best to do whatever that they can within the given time. So I think that this is like the first crucial thing apart from the software and hardware because you can have all that set up. But if you do not have trust and respect for your teammates, everything will just uh, go downhill. The second part is communications because it's very important that we are very clear with each other what we are talking about. Um, so we respect each other we respect each other and we have very open communication and we keep everything very short so we always talk in point forms <laughs> so if you look at our email is point one this point two this point three this and we reply by point 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 so that's the way we work and we don't have long email and we just say what needs to be done what's done what needs to be done what's done and like we are very open for design discussion. So we always keep it like an open mind, like, oh, what if we have this option and nothing is too stupid or nothing is like too out of the out of the world. We just want to throw in ideas. And that's where we throw it in Miro and we can see yes or no that we can do a vote. And I think it's also a good practice that before you start business as usual, check in with your teammates because you never know like what's happening over their side. And we can't see them. We can't have the body language. We cannot sense how they feel. So we really just like check in like everybody, how is everybody's emotional state at that day first? And then talk a little bit about our lives. And then we go in into the business as usual kind of mode. Um, sustainable workflow. Uh, Jesse, you want to talk? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it's just that uh, to have this sustainable mindset in what it means is like when you do something, uh, make sure that that works can be continued by the other team member. Like if I do this, if I put this wall here, Sam maybe can can edit it. Jendro maybe can edit it. So uh, that what I say. What we say is sustainable workflow, and um, we also like uh, improve and find the most efficient workflow. Like for example, uh, shall we do this to 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 design this, how we do this to design this. So it's it's uh, our main main idea is actually to reduce work hours. So we have more time <laughs> to uh, spend with our family and also to to avoid repetitive works like um, this sustainable workflow um, also help us to kind of like um, use this one model from schematic to construction. It's like everything is just like uh, update, Go upgrade, on. update, upgrade. Yeah, yeah, it's continuous. So there's no like uh, going back and forth. Oh, first I do the drawing and then you do the 3D and then go back to drawing again and then go back to 3D again. So I think it's, yeah, it's a very important mindset. Yeah. Sam, you want to jump in? <laughs> <laughs> can I say no? <laughs> okay, can I say Okay. <laughs> Basically, what we do is that we always have a loop back. So like during construction, whereby we kind of have certain details that we draw on our drawings. Then we realize that contractors actually miss out because they read, read it wrongly. Then we will, we will kind of feedback loop to the team to say, hey, you know, this drawing is not so clear. Next time we must indicate that the cabinet shelf must be 25 mm or uh, instead of the standard 15 mm, for example. Or like, hey, you know, they always miss out like the groove line for the LED strip. So we always see the dots. So we must make sure that our cabinetry has sufficient groove line for them to insert in the LED strips. So these are things that we are constantly like updating each other to say, please catch all, all these things or like, let's remember that we have to specify this and and also like it's important that we always update our library so that certain details can always be reused so again it's for the, the whole idea about the reducing the repetitive work and the last part i think it's a uh, more soft skill in that sense that when we do meet when we really do meet physically we really like keep it like as a team bonding kind of a session whereby 
uh, we really want to recalibrate like what is our personal goals and directions. So we were asked like that oh, what is it that you want for your life? You know, what is the kind of projects that you would like to do? You know, and like and, and see what is it that really motivate us as a team and to see how we want to set the direction that we want to go. And, and with that, we can really plan and reject or accept certain jobs according to our goals so that we can really do the things that matters to us and not waste time uh, in that sense because we don't know how long this is going to last, right? We also don't know whether we can survive in this kind of a very bad economy. And so we just want to do projects that we really like. And um, I think the other very important thing is that the cultural trips around Southeast Asia uh, gives us a lot of time to kind of like understand more about the regional fabric and also manufacturing process, which we then have time to actually work with them more closely because time that is saved up from using Archicad in our workflow. So these are the five points again. So trust and respect, very clear communication. We need to maintain a sustainable workflow. Basically, it's just because we don't want to work over time. Then evaluation and updates because we, we just need to keep on updating us so that we can reduce the, the, the repetitive work. And bonding to meetups, like really sincerely as friends, what is it that you want to do next in your career life and stuff like that. So the big question now is, why is it that we do what we do, right? Why do we do what we do? So uh, I think that the, the thing is that Desi and Sam wants to be back in Indonesia and in Chiang Mai, that's a fact. So everybody wants to set up their family in different countries. And I think the other part is that we really want to kind of like uh, reach out to the regional crafts, uh, also to be able to have access to the regional crafts that I think that our region is uh, not really that I think that there is more opportunities for us to express this kind of, uh, of uh, cultural uh, diversity within Southeast Asia. So through the time that we have, we visited like uh, uh, Ratan Furniture process, uh, production process to understand about their processes, or we go to Siemens and Tao's production to kind of work with them to get the exact blue color that we want. Or like we actually go to like reclaim uh, uh, shops that is somewhere in Yogyakarta, hidden somewhere because we have to ask the drivers for directions. A little bit of like scavenger hunt, but we really like it. And uh, it is through this kind of time that we spend in Southeast Asia that allows us to kind of get more material insight that could then be translated into our projects. And it's also about uh, making furniture, uh, to be able to be close to the to the to the carpenters to tell them exactly what kind of details that we will want to do for our custom set furniture, and uh, recently we also uh, went to a uh, Chiang Mai to kind of understand their ceramics making process, and we are thinking trying to bring ceramics also handmade materials into the texture of uh, interior textures. And we have time to meet up with like uh, regional architects as well as uh, ceramic artists. Um, to talk with them, to kind of share and um, have a dialogue with them to see what are they up to. So it's really like a journey that we want to bring, like go through our journey together uh, in this kind of way, rather than just in the office and just do, 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 you know, stuff like that. And we start also to free up some time to do a little bit of artistic exploration to see whether we could do like an extraction from paintings to ceramic tiles. And this is something that we did with uh, Lickman, Philip Lickman Ceramics in Bali. So basically what they did was that they took our drawings and paintings and then we translated it into tiles. And we wanted to see what is the kind of uh, effect that we can, if, can we introduce it into like interior spaces. Um, in the end, because of the quantity, we can't get um, our own manufactured tiles, but of course we are hoping to go towards that direction. But this is like a sample of what it could be in terms of uh, bringing textures into the interior. So I think back to the three points, uh, which is basically hardware, software, and humanware. I just probably want to share with everybody mm -hmm. that hardware, software is very important. Archicad plays a very big part in our workflow. But I think the idea of the humanware is also very important to kind of like slow down a bit, to understand your goals and to respect each other uh, so that you can actually have this sustainable workflow working remotely. Yeah. Anything you want to add, Desi or Seth? <laughs> yeah, oh, that's good. Yeah. Wow, Very I think it's re really a lot to take in. And 
much competitive. Uh, <laughs> no, no, it's it's I think is is almost like a lesson. It's amazing how you know within this. First of all, it looks like you were you knew what was coming with this work from home because you not you're not allowing to work from home. You're allowing to work from home country, which is <laughs> you know something that everybody would like to do, uh, especially in a country you know full of expats like like Singapore. Um, so you, I like to see how you know you don't need to have like a very big team to think like this. You know to think about being ultra connected. Um, to be on your toes in terms of having uh, hardware and technology supporting your practice. Because uh, I have no doubts that even if you have to just hand sketch everything, you would make beautiful projects. So the three mm -hmm. of you are obviously very talented and you'll be, you would be able to do it anyway, but you're leveraging on technology to communicate, to, to between yourselves, between the client, between the contractors, even you know going to the site, understand, and you can see that all that uh, goes through. Um, and any, oh. I think everybody here. I've been receiving some text, texts even uh, on on WhatsApp saying, "Wow, so good." So if somebody <laughs> has questions to to yeah. ask or wants to, nice you know, feedback. Um, uh, how you feel about this, I think it's, it's very good. And it comes, I think, from basic principles, right? For like uh, like you say, we respect the time, we have working agreements, we we focus on the projects and we make sure everything comes out nicely. So yeah, it looks easy. We know how hard it is, but it looks very easy. Make it look easy. So anyone has anything to like... add? Or... To ask, I have, I have some I have some questions if if yeah. it's uh, possible to join. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I I joined the I sneak into the the presentation uh -huh. to Marcelo from Hong Kong. Um, yeah. Well, first uh -huh. of all, as Marcelo was saying, uh, we you know it's 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 really impressive the work you you guys do. It's it's really amazing. Um, actually, as an architect, I was talking here with my partner George. Uh, we are very jealous because the projects look <laughs> fantastic. So congratulations. Um, so yeah, I mean, I have, a, of course, I have a lot of questions. I would like to ask a lot of things related with the whole process and, and detailing and your trips and how you deal with contractors, clients, collaborators. But I mean, I'm just going to ask a couple of things. The first one is related to the Archicad uh, workflow, which is um, for your projects, do you have um, one template that you use for the different scales you work on or you have several templates uh, to develop your projects? Um, maybe that's you want to reply because I talk too much already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think for now we use the same templates for all different uh, projects. Yeah, the template right. is the same, but we always up update. So for example, we have this template, right? And then for the next project, we think that uh, some part of the library is not okay, or maybe there's more efficient way to do it, then we constantly update the templates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. That's really, really Usually we really don't useful. update fast fast enough for, for the Archicad release. <laughs> <laughs> Once we finish 23, then 24 comes out, then we're like, okay. <laughs> yeah, of course. No, no, but that, that's good to know. I mean, this is challenging to have only one template, but that's that's great. Um, and then the second question is, is really not Archicad related, but it's just curiosity as a, you know, you you, you, you guys operate also in, in different countries and we, we do the same, but we often encounter the problem that, um, you know, in, in different countries, we always have to collaborate with local architects. Uh, from the you know for different reasons one is because we're not allowed to sign projects in that country or uh because to do the official submission um and then of course when it comes to deal with the contractor we need to have also like a local partner that help us to do you know all sort of collaborations and, and, and follow up in your case i mean I, I, how do you do that do you um have you by any by any reason are you are you registered architects in also Indonesia and Thailand and these countries you work or or you always need to deal with a with a partner how, how is in your in your case so Desi and Sam is registered right yes yeah they are registered. registered in the country 
So if there's Indonesian projects, then we will throw it to Desi. <laughs> if there's Thailand projects, we will throw it to Sam. But you have to understand Southeast Asia is not that strict yet, right, Desi? Like, yeah, in that uh, sense, it's like, yeah. 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 So, uh, in, in terms of authorities, we are registered architects, but um, if, if, I mean, if we work with other consultants, you mean like in terms of software, we just use Archicad and then if they need CAD, then we just export to CAD like that. Yeah, and we use BIMX a lot, then they really like BIMX. <laughs> yeah. Cool. And how about you? Mm, I'm also a registered architect here, and but the, I, I, I kind of, if we need to do the local project here, right, all the consultants here, they use CAD and SketchUp. So it's kind of, if we need to send something to them, we need to like export to CAD and like really use that thing. Yeah, send them the SketchUp and CAD. But the good thing is IKCAD can export. So actually it's okay to, to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. What is your issues when you, when you, mm. when you work with the local? What are your what are your problems that you face actually? You heard your hand. He's asking you what are ah, normally so, the issues you have when you operate. Ah, sorry, sorry. So you were asking yeah, among your 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 teammates. No, I mean in our case oof, depends. Every project or every country is like a different different story. But for example, uh, when we export our CAD files, depending yeah. on the client or the project, we have a lot yeah. of problems. <laughs> because a lot of a lot of companies are very uh, you know like very yeah yeah, yeah I, I don't know if saying professional or you know so they use whatever we send they use it as a reference mm. as as they yeah. should be doing yeah. so they use it as a, as, as a you know uh, trace uh, they trace on top of it they do their own drawings so there's no problem but a lot of uh, consultants they want to use uh, the 2D drawings to use them to develop their own and of course mm. they complain a lot um because of course the the, the drawings uh, the the cat files from Arctica are, are not pretend to be as if a human did them yeah. so of course yeah. it's it's not easy so we we struggle with that depending on the project sometimes uh teams are really like we just want a cat as as if a person did it and we have yeah. a lot of problems i i don't know if you you encounter also problems like that when sharing yeah, a little bit right that's it a little yeah, bit. a little bit, but um, mm. actually, um, as long as we set our drawings in the correct layers, and when we translate to uh, DWG, we we use a, I mean, we set up a very Trans good translator. I think yeah, it minimizes the problem. <laughs> but I know mm. sometimes they they are having headache to read our drawings, but yeah, it's. Yeah. yeah, I cannot do anything. There's always a translation. Yeah. yeah. Sorry? There's always a translation. So we need to manage the expectations from the other side. Probably, I think we have here a master that could help us answer these kind of questions. Catherine, would you like to, to say? Yeah, I just want to check in. Um, th those people, I mean, we also work with people who are still stuck in the 2D world. Many of the people that we work with are still using AutoCAD and SketchUp. Uh, and contractors are still doing their shop drawings in AutoCAD. So quite often we, we uh, export a lot of DWG to them. Uh, but I would say that as a user of BIM or user of AutoCAD, uh, it, you know, it, actually it's their problem, you know, it's not our problem. You know, if, if they are stuck in the past, it's not our problem. We shouldn't be solving their problems for them. As it is already, we're actually spoon feeding a lot. Anytime they want a section, we can just cut a section anywhere they want and we can just give it, you know, just with a blink of an, of an eye, we can generate as many sections, elevation, details as they want. And usually within one or two working days. So I would say that actually it's not really a problem. Maybe it's better if we communicate to them the benefits of them migrating to BIM rather than trying to solve their 2D problems in BWG. That's what I think. Yeah. Yeah, well, I totally agree. I totally agree. Those advantages are really, as you were saying, we can provide more documentation. We can provide, yeah. uh, you know, more information. 
and and yeah and it's it's great it's just that sometimes you know depends how stubborn they are you know sometimes it's like you can tell that i don't know that yeah sometimes it's just hard to communicate those values right but you're right i totally agree totally agree with yeah i think once they realize uh how much easier it is to go to me then you know they will realize that you know they are actually constraining themselves if they want to insist that everything is still in pwg it, 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 yeah. then, then their, their working hours will be spent just laboriously drawing all these 2D things, yeah. which all of us have liberated ourselves from that already yeah, when we use when we use Archicad. And uh, I, I actually, uh, what I like to say actually about um, the work uh, and the, the way of working is this is exactly what an architect should be. Uh, I think Archicad, the power of Archicad is that it's returning the the what an architect is supposed to be is returning it back to us because in the old way of working we have to spend so much time on the technical part you know the the documentation portion is so essential because we have to communicate ideas to someone to someone who is going to build it and using something like architect we are able to actually communicate so much better and also the degree of detailing you know it is given you all that time to really go and explore and more time to design and more time to um, travel and look at the materials and you know that's exactly what an architect is supposed to be so uh, to me actually this software is and that is actually the rev revolutionary part of this software is that it allows us to return to what we are supposed to be yeah yeah that's right <laughs> fully agree yeah but yeah we that's what i've been trying to tell everyone it's just that people are so resistant to change uh, yeah i think uh, obviously what we can see here is that uh the early adopters if we can still consider this early are the ones who start benefiting from it obviously from what zenro just presented today he, he makes it look very easy which we all know that it's not okay there's a learning curve there's um, you know a few years of research of optimizing the way how to work and all that and uh, that part she didn't put there <laughs> the presentation but it's you know even if you're going you know it's always even if you're improving a tiny bit every project so what she said is very important in terms of you know, taking a template, improving the template from version to version, project to project, learn with the lessons from a previous project and use it on the next one. You know, when you look back three years ago, how you were practicing and how you're practicing now, if you want to leverage on technology, you can really improve a lot. I think a lot of people just, uh, you know, go and uh, keep the way how they how they used to work from 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and they want to continue working like that. They believe that, well, you know, it works for me as it is now. So why wouldn't it work in 10 years time? Well, I, I normally, since we're talking a bit about technology, I normally say, yeah, you try to use a phone from 15 years ago nowadays, you lose your clients, you <laughs> not even your family will call you, you know, because nowadays, uh, yeah, the technology is different and we have to definitely leverage on it. Uh, there's, there's a question on the chat uh, on point cloud scanning, which I'm also interested to know because we're also trying to model a conservation building right now. So, uh, what what device do you use for your point cloud scanning, and how I do you get the, how do you get into your model? So the the scanner the scanning 3D scanning was actually done by a, a surveyor. I can send the details to to Marcelo after the check because I don't have the the information right now. I think he yeah. he used like a 3D scanner, but I'm not so sure which brand he used it. So it's a professional person who does details. it. I yeah. actually know. Then, yeah. And then he also did the survey drawings. Uh, this is when we use the survey drawings to kind of model out the, the conservation building. So the next step that we want to do, but we haven't tried yet, but we want to do is to kind of open the beam cloud, uh, sorry, the point clouds and integrate it together with our build model to check size or the accuracy of the beam model. Oh, so That's the theoretical. Model, uh, right now, yeah. the model that you have done is uh, basically yes. projected from the surveyor's measured drawing, is it? Uh, 
Uh, no. So the model is built up as, as how we will build the model. Yeah, yes. But oh, without the point cloud input. Yeah, without the point cloud. The point cloud input is for the surveyor to take the 3D scan, translate to his 2D drawings, which we, we then took the 2D drawings to translate to the 3D model. But to check the accuracy of the 3D model, we need to put back the point cloud to kind no, of actually, like... Okay, okay. so we have the same thing as you because we are modeling our building from the plan surveillance and sections. Yeah, yeah, uh, we, yeah. Uh, yeah. So whether um, okay, so you didn't really yeah. rely on point cloud. No, so right now I think the I still haven't figured it out yet. But I think the issue with the point cloud is that it is very heavy. If depending on how many points that you take from the model. So uh, it will be impossible for us to just do a very easy pan around to have facilitate discussion. So our idea is to create the BIM model so that uh, when we have a uh, discussion on uh, Zoom or whatever it is, we can really flash and have a visual on the, 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 the detailing and stuff like that. That's our first uh, kind of motivation. Our second motivation is, of course, we want to test out new stuff. So that's when the point cards will come in to kind of test the model, whether it works or not. I mean, that's for our own curiosity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but a very interesting story I want to share is that when we started this and Archicad, uh, when we started to choose the software Archicad, we re I really banned, I banned <laughs> all other software. I say, no DW, no AutoCAD, no SketchUp, no, like, I re we really like very banned, like ban, ban, ban. And, uh, at first, it's a bit like everybody is a bit a bit worried, like you know whether or not we could we could do it. Uh, but then subsequently, once you give time, uh, then we just evolve into it. So I think maybe a tip for like maybe uh, met bosses or uh, not bosses, but in general like team leaders or stuff like that to give a bit time for your for your teammates to to pick it up if they don't start with actually they are not conversant with that that that, that program. Yeah. Interesting. So, uh, any more questions? We have KP. Yeah, any was, questions? Uh, any questions for Desi and Sam? <laughs> yeah. Ask them about anything uh, in Thailand and Indonesia. <laughs> no? Hmm? Very clear so, already. <laughs> so, so how, how's working with Zenru, Desi and Sam? You, last time you complained a lot. Is it better now? Uh, no. Actually, it's Who's better because we don't, have, <laughs> we don't we don't have overtime really. We work on time, nine to really? six. It's really yeah. good. Yeah. Okay, that's very. So since you started using Archicad, now you don't have overtime. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes. Actually, actually, I I always say this. So I'm uh, for those who don't know, I'm also an architect, uh, and I used to use Ar Archicad for my projects before, and the reason why I did that is because I'm really lazy so so i see that you know even if it takes more work to learn something and later i can save you know one hour a day for the rest of my life i, I don't care even if it takes me two months to learn it and i do over time for those two months to to learn it go through a project that will make me suffer a bit more then later on if i can benefit from it let's do it so i think that it's it's hard to endure the, in in the beginning and see that you know I was so fast with AutoCAD now I start with this one and I'm not as fast in the beginning. Well, if if you see a presentation like this, you see that later you'll be able to catch up and and benefit from it, right? Yeah, I, I think, think there's a question, thing. right? Yeah, sorry, Sam. Sam, yes. Yeah. Okay, I think the thing that we always do, right? We we like to like update on the technology it's like if it's a new thing coming up that it can help us right we really open to learn and really can like oh it is good and better for us for the workflow and can make us work efficiently and then also faster so we really can easy to change like for example like i think last time we used skype right then we changed to zoom and last time we, we also use like zoom <laughs> zoom still using but we have the mirror it's just like recent month yeah, just a few mm -hmm. months, but now we can use Zoom, some uh, Miro, sometime to replace PPT PowerPoint already. Mm -hmm. So uh -huh. actually, it's like yeah. whatever that is easy for us, 
then we just change. We, we don't stuck with that. You, always like use this and need to use this forever, ever, ever. Yeah. So it's like you're open yeah, to change. Right? To adapt. Yes, open yeah. to change. Mm. I think so the other thing that, that really that comes in line. Sorry. We want to add on is that, okay, because I want to explain the workflow previously that we did. So what happens is that we will do the model. I will be on the go sometimes. Then uh, the team would like export in PDF. I will have a PDF reader. I'll have my iPad and I will sketch and I'll send it back. So at that point in time, we already think it's very progressive. Like, wow, so fast paperless. We can sketch and we can send it at PDF, scan, sketch. It. But we realized that this is a very linear workflow because one person can do it, one person can comment, and one person can revise. Oh, I mean, multiple person can revise, but it is not collaborative. I mean, even though we do it in um, real time in Archicad, but what I'm trying to say is the design thinking, like, oh, maybe some this, some that, some this, some that. So when we discovered Miro, which was a very good application on top of this, is that we, we did away with all the annotations already. So basically, everything comes onto this whiteboard like all the inspirations, like images, we see random stuff, then we put take picture, put it on the board, then we can sketch over it, then we can put notes and comments, then it becomes really like a collaborative process, like what do you think, what do I think, what do Sam think, what do Desi think? Then when we come up with that, then we realize that this is the direction, then we use this to go into Archicad, then we will start to model exactly, and we put it up the 3D again, then we comment on it again, then we refine on it again, then we go back to Archicad, then we do it again. So. In that sense, we are still doing sketching digitally together, and then we translate it into a cloud kind of a, a model that nobody is doing extra work and overlapping and stuff like that. So one person can be doing aircon, one person can be doing light switches, one person can be authorizing other stuff. So I think that's quite an interesting uh, workflow for us right now that is helping us quite a bit. So we, we try to always eliminate the linear progression, like somebody must lead and somebody must do somebody. So it's always a little bit like uh, convoluted, like everything is happening at the same time. I think that's how we want our workflow to be as well. Mm -hmm. And the younger More people- More integrated the better, right? Yeah, so let's say we hire June uh, recently in Chiang Mai as well. So June would be able to see how we do it. So like she, meanwhile, she can also come into the board. She can see how we discuss then, it can be learned very intuitively as well. So at least this is what we think. <laughs> we don't know how it's going to happen in the end. Uh. I think yeah. you, you uh, just answered the question on the chat that Wei Sheng yeah. has about the mindset yeah. of a clinical practice. Uh, I, I would think that like the way you're working now is, you know, because Archicad allows everything to happen simultaneously, right? So yeah. those practices that are still stuck in the production line structure yeah. will, will uh, not really benefit so much from using this tool. Uh, you know, if, if they're having someone just sketching freehand, then pass to someone else to model. Yeah. Yeah. The, the biggest yeah. change in the workflow is that the, the person who is designing should be the one doing the modeling. Because yeah. when you're modeling, you see what's going on and you can change your mind and you can continue designing. Yeah. You know, it, so what you've described actually is actually those of us who are doing it ourselves have already uh, discovered or maybe we didn't discover, maybe we were doing this all along. Uh, <laughs> that, you know, I mean, actually, even when we were doing two, when we were doing 2D drafting, we were already, uh, because we were doing our own drafting, when we were drawing in 2D, we were already making changes all the time uh, or, or designing all the time. But, Archicad makes it a lot more uh, like you can do so much more exploration because you don't worry about how many drawings you need to change. You don't worry about, yeah. oh, I changed the plan now, I've got to go back and change the elevation and section and whatever. You don't worry, right? You, just, you can just keep on exploring. Yeah, yeah, fully, fully agree. So basically, uh, at least if somebody is you know, is not doing the work and not doing the BIM part. I think what I see in the industry is at least they don't, they should understand what is doing the work and do, what is the BIM part. Because well, I also understand that we can't expect everyone to be hands-on in a, in a company, it's probably like in small and medium, uh, that, that's the best practice um, yeah. or that's the safest. But even you know, from in a in a bigger company, at least you know how to review the projects, 
you know how to navigate through a project, you know what the BIM concept is. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's the same as, you know, what we've been doing before. It's just that it's more integrated, like uh, Zenru has been talking about. So I think, I think that... Uh, just one more yeah, tip sure. uh, before I forget, sorry. I think another very, very important part that we didn't put inside the presentation is the accuracy of the existing drawings has to be very accurate. So I think there is one story whereby I did the site measurements wrong. <laughs> and then, um, of course, the model came out. And then we realized that the models is actually off by maybe like 20 cm or like 30 cm. And there's no way that you should do it on 2D because uh, Desi almost killed me. She's like, what? Mm -hmm. So uh, we had to remodel the existing model. That means we have to remodel the, the design again because the existing is not accurate. So the first very key, if you take away point, is your first site must be really accurate in terms of your modeling. It must be because it affects everything downstream. Second point is that before you start any project, your template must be really like, you know, all the stuff that you need before so that you don't repeat things again and set up layers again or set up certain objects again. So try to get your template correct and your your existing plans accurate. Then everything will work properly. Once that, that, that first initiation start is very important. Yeah, I, I agree. Actually, that reminded me of something too uh, about change of uh, workflow. Because in the past, when we were in 2D world, in, uh, when we were doing A and A, sometimes we will hire a draftsman to just, you know, we buy the plans from DCA, right? So in the past, we would some uh, sometimes hire a draftsman to just draw that. Because it was like just mindless copying, right? And after that, we do our A and A. But now with Archicad, actually, we find we cannot do that. We cannot hire someone to just model the existing. We have to do it ourselves. Because as you say, we have to ensure that the base is accurate. And yeah. also, it's not actually just a mindless copy. When we, when we model from the existing plans from BCA, we are actually getting to know the building. As we are modeling the existing building, we, yeah. then we know its structure. We know everything about that building. And then we can do the A&A. So the, the exercise of remodeling it is not a mindless thing that you can give the technician. It becomes actually part of the design process. So that's another change that I found in the workflow with using BIM. Yeah. I agree. It's, it really helps you to understand the thing better. Yeah. And if you, can, if you can figure out how to model something in plan, you model in 3D or you model in section or you model in elevation, any view is good for that. Yeah. So, whereas in, in if you're doing like view by view, you, it's, you have to figure it out everywhere. Yeah. So, so I can see we could stay here the whole night. We have a very group of passionate people. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, if, uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll wrap up at least the presentation and then yeah. we can one, continue. One parting comment, I think we should all collaborate. I mean, like, you know, it, uh, this platform, this user platform is great for us to, to share our ideas and it's an opportunity for all of us to collaborate too. I, I'm thinking we could even pre create like a, a kind of a user group. And uh, I've done this before. Now with the COVID, I don't know if it's possible, but I've done this before uh, that we had, you know, a kind of gathering with people that have like the same kind of mindset or even if you're not working exactly this way yet, you know that you want to do that, we can get together, I can get some budget, we can get some food and drinks, and we can discuss and see how we can work together. And another thing, I see that, you know, the fact that, you know, this being a small company is not necessarily bad. And if anything, I see that it's the other way around. Because you have the ability to team up and work together with any other uh, company that has the same kind of mindset as you have. So for example, as Zenru said that she's working with Ching Design, I know that they're also pro Archicad users. They, they, so it's very easy to team up and work together in a project. So I see, uh, as Catherine mentions, a lot of uh, benefit from this collaborative uh, environment. And uh, I will take this offline, Catherine, and we'll see how we can leverage on this because I. Uh, I think that this is becoming a, a common place for people with this kind of mindset. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I also have an ulterior motive to prove that smaller practices can really make big, uh, 
you know, can do big things, we can do really significant things. It, it, size doesn't matter anymore. Uh, in in yeah. in this century, if you are big, yeah. it's it, it's becomes a, a you know a, becomes a handicap rather than an a, an advantage. And being small actually now is an advantage because the technology is so accessible. And the most important thing is we have to be enthusiastic with our work. We have to love our work, and then that's what drives us. And then you know then we will find ways to 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 do things. Yeah. Really, I, I couldn't agree yeah. more. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so we have a uh, uh, Lin Chiao saying also that she liked the idea of having this virtual interaction, so we don't have to travel. Yeah, yeah. And, and we can, uh, or we can even travel. Let's say we can work like this from the beach. Who knows, right? Yeah. Or from a, a mountain retreat. Yeah. Actually, yeah. enzyme also takes advantage of that a lot, right? Yeah. You never know when to contact yeah. them. Are they in Spain or in US or in <laughs> or in Hong Kong? It doesn't matter, man. We're always working. Yeah. So at the end of the day, <laughs> they're on holidays, but no, they're really not. <laughs> I'm sure your 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 mothers don't call the office if they want to talk to you because the chance of you being there is very low. Even well, we don't you... have we don't have phone in the office, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Just call us, you know, by, by WhatsApp or, or by, by phone or, yeah, Zoom, Skype, Teams, go to meeting. They yeah. always find, I, I wish they find us, they find us more to give us projects, of course. But yeah, obviously. yeah, don't worry, it will be coming. So basically, uh, I want to wrap up the, the meeting. We can then stop the recording and uh, continue talking. But basically, you can continue to follow us on social media. So I have here the, the Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn uh, um, QR codes. So if you want to join us or just look for Graphics Out Singapore. This video, like the other seven episodes from uh, uh, Archicad Now, uh, will be available at, uh, at our YouTube page, the Singapore uh, Graphisoft uh, YouTube page. We, we're getting like more and more views uh, every time, so this will be for, forever there. So whoever talk about cat drawings, bad stuff uh, will be right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to highlight also that all of you, and especially now with all this uh, COVID situation, but for those who are clients and um, are with active SSA, you can anytime join our, our trainings. So these are the upcoming trainings we have here. I know that we will release newer dates. So tomorrow there will be an Archicad Advanced Modeling training. Probably you're still on time to go and, and register for it. We'll have another Archicad Basic training uh, coming next week. And you can always like follow graphisoft.com slash sg slash courses and see what are the trainings coming up um, so that you can you know, improve your, your skills. We already have a preview of the next series of the webinar. We're going to take a couple of weeks break to, to record and to talk with our producer team. <laughs> so starting in the beginning of August uh, on the 4th, we'll have a uh, um, a session about 3D styles, so about how to present a model in, in 3D, how to use the 3D styles from Archicad. Um, so James will have a session about this. I will have a session one, one week later about Archicad Twin Motion workflow. We know that you know most of our users are already using Twin Motion, but it would be good if I can you know showcase how they can take advantage of some tips and tricks here. Um, then we will have another session a week after about customizing the Archicad work environment. So setting up a work environment for different uh, parts of you know of your work. If you're doing mostly modeling, probably you need less documentation tools or or you need some um, buttons to be more available. If you're doing documentation part only, you want to customize it or just layouts or just working on 2D. So we will showcase how you can use that, and um, then we'll we're still in the looking for a next guest speaker. So I will contact some of you out there to see if you'd like to showcase also how you work. I know it's becoming harder and harder because uh, 
our users are putting a lot of effort to showcase how awesome they are and it might scare a bit the other users but don't worry you know we we've all been there and we or we want to be there so let's uh let's communicate and show how we work and uh, i'd like to thank you all for um uh, for attending the the session and um we can stay a bit longer if you want to exchange some words and see you in uh, uh, after the two weeks break from this session for Archicad Now Season 3. Okay, okay, thank you, Marcelo. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. And a special thanks, thank obviously, you. to thank Deiru you. and Desi and uh, Sam. You, 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 your presentation was really inspiring. I feel like going back to design now. <laughs> 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 Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, okay, thank, thank you. you, thank you. Thank you.